te whānau, uh, nā wairangi toko tupuna uh, e whānau me tipa hau ki Wanganui, uh, ko Taranaki Tamonga te rūne taku nākau uh, to te Wanganui te awa e mahia nei uh, aku uh, māharahara, ko uh, Ngāti Tiriti a hau, ko David Downs toko ingoa. Tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora! <laughs> Actually, can I put that another way? I'm an ex! <laughs> Some of you are going, what is that about? I'm not sure. That was from Maggie's session earlier. But I felt like I, had to, I have to bring it now because we were just given a lesson by one of the best speakers I've seen in a very long time, and she was amazing. And I'll tell you something, we're all going to be working for her one day. Um, I could be your poi boy. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be awesome. I just, you have such a future. And, and I've loved being here for the last couple of days because I've managed to sort of soak in the atmosphere and really understand what it is, what's going on in New Zealand. And I'm going to tell you a story. Today, this session today is about um, kind of going from insights to action. It's we are the people we are waiting for. And so um, thanks to some people at the session I was at earlier today, I've completely re rewritten uh, most of my presentation. So stick with me because I want to sort of reflect on what does it mean that we have to take action. And I, we saw some action here. I'm going to start with a personal story and then I'm going to go a little bit wider. Um, and Guy mentioned it earlier, but a few years ago, I sat in a doctor's office uh, in Auckland and the doctor said to me, you've got less than a year to live. So I did what anyone would do in those circumstances. And I went straight to Harvey Norman and bought a whole lot of stuff on two year interest free terms. <laughs> uh, which seemed like a great idea, but as you can see, unfortunately I've lived. And <laughs> And now I've got like all these lounge suites I don't really need, so. But my story, like, I won't tell you a whole story, but my, my career is a really strange one. I got to tell some people it today. I started my life, I went to university, I dropped out after a year, I became a comedian. Not a very good one, as you can see, because now I'm doing something else. Um, but, and then I, and I became an actor, and I just went on this path that life took me on for ages. I set up my own companies, not as cool as the poi business, but they were pretty cool. Um, and then I worked for a big multinational corporation, and then I worked for, um, the, I decided I wanted to work for the government of New Zealand and, and add back at a big system level. And so I've had all these different careers, and often I've changed, um, chosen them, but quite often they've chosen me. And one of those careers chose me that day in the doctor's office where my doctor said, you've got this thing called cancer. Uh, it's called lymphoma, it's a blood cancer. And I said, that wasn't on my agenda for today. I'm sorry, I've got meetings, I'm very busy, I'm quite important, I haven't got time for cancer. And she said, well, I'm sorry, but you're gonna spend the next year or so battling cancer. And that was my next job, sort of appeared out of the blue. I was a cancer patient. And she said, not only have you got this cancer, but you've had it for quite some time, because when we do this image of you, you've got a tumor about the size of a basketball kind of stuck in and around all the bits that you usually keep yourself alive with. So, you know, we need to get you into hospital really, really fast. And look, a lot of time went past. I won't bore you with all the details, but I spent about a year in hospital, going in and out of hospital, getting treatment, chemotherapy. And every time we finished the treatment, because I'm quite optimistic person, I'd go, yes, I'm finished my cancer treatment, yeah. And we had a little tiny party, and then we'd do another test, and the doctor would go, oh, actually, sorry, um, your cancer's come back. And it kept coming back and coming back. And finally, I got to the point where I was sitting in that doctor's office, and she said, we've now tried 12 different types of chemo. You know, we've been doing this for over a year. Your body's pretty wrecked. We're out of options. She said, we think maybe you should, um, we should just give up and you should get in, go into hospice. She said, maybe you should go home and get your affairs in order. Which was difficult because I hadn't had any affairs. Um, <laughs> I mean, it would have been nice. There's like nurses and stuff around all the time, but... It wasn't going to happen. But it was an incredible period of my life because that was the moment that I realized, look, if someone's going to do something, it has to be me now. Like, there is no one else. The medical system have said they can't do anything. It has to be me and my wife and my family and my sister and my mother and my whanau and all the support people that Georgia mentioned as well. And for me, what was really incredible was that we shared, we were sharing the story of, my, of me going through this cancer journey uh, to lots and lots of people on the internet. And one day, I, as part of this, I got this message out of the blue. I got this beautiful message over LinkedIn. And you, anyone here, by the way, join me on LinkedIn, and I always offer this to people. If I can help you, I ever will. Because 
the thing that saved my life was I was writing a column on stuff. I was writing about my experience of going through cancer and sharing it. And it was being shared all around the world, this sort of, this online column. And I got this message out of the blue from this guy. And, I, and he said, you, look, you don't know me, I don't know you, but I just want to let you know I've been reading your column. And if I can ever do anything to help you, let me know. A beautiful thing to do to another human being, just to offer themselves with no expectation of, of anything in return. So I went to him and I said, yes. And I looked him up, first of all, and I, thought he, I found out he's the head of immunology at Pfizer, the drug company in New York that we all know about now because we're using their vaccines. But back then we didn't know about it. I didn't know about him. And, and he turns out he, he had been to New Zealand on holiday many years ago and just loves New Zealand. And so was reading New Zealand newspapers and happened to read my column and happened to think, hey, maybe I could help that guy. Such a powerful thing to be the person that reaches out to someone else and say, could I help you? Amazing. So I went to him and I said, yes, I need your help. Within a couple of hours, he had put me in touch with friends of his at Harvard Medical School in Boston. And those people got hold of me on the, on the phone the next day and we're having a phone call back and forth and they're saying, oh, tell us about your treatment. What have you been doing? Da, da, da. And then they said, but we think you could be a candidate for this new clinical trial of a new type of cancer treatment, but you're going to have to come to Boston. So I hung up the phone and I was like, yes, like a new opportunity has come. And I went into my doctor the next day and I had the joy of saying to her, look, uh, you know, I'm not going to take your advice because I met a guy on the internet. Um, <laughs> they love that sort of thing. But it was amazing. And then, of course, what happens is, with life is things don't always go smoothly, you know, paths go in different directions. And I thought we were onto a new idea and then suddenly I got a new, an, a, another surprise, another twist in the tail. And this time it's another email this time it's from the billing department of the hospital in Boston where they say to me, dear Mr. Downs, your treatment could cost you one million US dollars. Please let me know if you'd like to proceed. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, look. Oh. So I don't know what to do. I said to her, first of all, the first thing I did, like any good Kiwi, I picked up the phone and I said, would you offer a discount for cash? <laughs> um, I didn't have any cash, I didn't have anywhere that sort of money, but I thought like, it was worth a try. And she said, uh, well... Okay, and I went, yeah, cool. Now it's only a 750,000 US dollar problem. That's fantastic, we're making some real progress here. So I said, okay, can you send me through a detailed estimate, like a letter that I can give to my bank? And she said, yeah, yeah, I'll send you through a detailed estimate, and she sent me this. <laughs> That's no joke, I have framed that, it's on the wall in my, in my house. But as you can see, there's no surcharge, you know? So you gotta look at the bright side. So, okay, massive problem in my hands, all right? I'm dying of cancer, literally. And I'm sorry if this is triggering when I should have mentioned that, of course. Um, I've got this opportunity, potentially. I've got to solve, we've got to solve this problem. And this is where friends and family, Fano come in. We are the people who need to create action. And the action was this one. Some, a friend of mine did a Give a Little campaign. Now, Give a Little was not a sustainable way to fund the health system of New Zealand, in case there are any politicians listening, all right? And on one hand, it was amazing and incredible and, and, and awesome. Like you can see the $100,000, $150,000 got given to me. On the other hand, it was embarrassing and humbling and just so cringing because people that I didn't even know were just giving me money to fund my medical treatment. And it was like, oh my God. And, and some other friends did a show. And between the two things, we got enough money. I called the people in Boston. I said, look, I don't have a million, I don't have a million US dollars, but I've got like 200,000 Kiwi dollars. Maybe I could pay you that, and then I could pay you the rest when I'm better. Um, <laughs> and they said, yes, which is awesome. So I found myself suddenly here in Boston going through this advanced cancer treatment. And I want to, I'm not going to bore you with what it was about, but I want to just reflect on a couple of lessons there because it was such an amazing experience and part of my life. And clearly, uh, spoiler alert, I lived. Um, <laughs> should have mentioned that. But um, yeah, thank you. I did say to someone today, when I say that, can you clap? So thanks for the desultory clap. <laughs> I'll take your pity clap. That's fun. Um, but it made me think about a lot about things, and it made me think about an experience that happened to me once. And I told this story earlier, and I wasn't intending on telling it today, but the people at the table said, you should tell that story, so I'm going to tell it. And it's a story about a few years ago, I was going for a big job, and I was working at Microsoft, going for a big job. It was like a big promotion, and I had to fly up to Singapore. It was like the fifth or sixth uh, uh, job interview in this series of interviews, and it was with the big boss, you know, the vice president of the region. And I walked into the guy's office, 
thinking, oh, he's going to ask me all these really detailed questions about business and, you know, strategy. And, and he said, actually, I've only got one question for you. When you drive to the airport and you're running late, do the traffic lights go green or red? And I thought, oh, no, it's a trick question. Oh, some sort of IT question I don't, about traffic light control systems. <laughs> but then I thought, no, it's not. I, I don't get it. I'll just answer honestly. I said, oh, they go green. Like, I've never missed a flight. Like, I can't ever remember missing a flight because of red light. Like, something will happen. The, the car will go a different way or the plane will be late and I'll get it anyway or whatever. But I've never missed a flight. And he said, that's great because I don't want to hire someone who's unlucky. <laughs> and that was the end of the job interview. It was a 90-second job interview. And I thought about that a lot, all right, particularly through this period of my life going through cancer because, of course, what that guy was telling me was teaching me an incredibly valuable lesson, which I hope to give to you. He wasn't actually asking me about the traffic lights. What he was saying to me is, how do you perceive the world? Do you notice the things that get in your way? and make them the blocker? Are you a victim of your circumstances? Or are you the sort of person that sees the green traffic lights, that sees the opportunities, that finds a way? And that's me, I've always been that. I'm always an optimistic person, sometimes to my detriment, but most of the time it works out. I find opportunities. And I think that's a really valuable lesson. Think about that. Are you, are you, when things are going against you, are you seeing the green lights or the red lights? You can't control what happens around you. You can't control the traffic lights. What you can control is what you do about it, how you perceive it, how you see those other opportunities. So anyway, I came back to New Zealand and I thought, what am I gonna do with my life now? Like I've just been through this incredible, you know, near death experience. I'm better, what should I do? And I, and I decided I really need to pay it forward to other people. Like, you know, a lot of people gave me money and time and energy and I need to pay it forward. And I just love the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, with some charity stuff that I get involved with and, you know, and doing doctor talks and things like that. But, but I, don't, I don't wanna talk about that because I wanna talk about what we all do next. Yeah, it's that moment in our lives sometimes, like my moment where I had to think, I am the person who has to do something next. This is the moment we are all next. And it's a bit of a sign because I went for a walk this morning. Just 200 metres that way was this plaque. It's true. You can't live here by chance. You have to do and be, not simply watch or even describe. This is the city, the place, the country of action, the world headquarters of the verb. I just, that's the sign. When I saw that, I went, nah, that poem is speaking to me. This beautiful poet... She, was, she lived um, over the last hundred years. She wrote this poem, the idea that we have to be the people who create action. And we're in the place where action happened. And I just love the last couple of days. Like Guy said, I've been sort of hanging out here like some sort of weirdo, um, but with my son, actually. And we were, we've been looking at, and I just love it, you know, make your mark. What are you going to do to make your mark on the world? This is the beautiful things that we've been seeing at the back, you know, these wonderful paintings, this interactivity, the generosity of spirit that you're all showing. I just am blown away. Like, we are in really good shape as a country. I'm incredibly optimistic um, because of all of you and because of the sort of wairua that comes through on this sort of occasion, the beauty that you give each other, the respect, you know, that you taught me a lot, teaching me a lot. I'm, I, I went to that Ask an Expert session. I had nine experts at the table and me, you know. I was learning they were teaching me constantly. And I've just loved that we're in this place now and we're seeing things like the Sustainable Development Goals be something that we can really engage with and understand the power of that sort of exercise. I love that, that there's this exercise where people can put their dreams for the oceans and the mana uh, up on the board. And it reminded me of what, what Sir Ian Taylor, ta Ian Taylor uh, gifted us at the beginning of uh, on Friday night. I loved this session. And he said to us that the footsteps laid down by our ancestors, create the paving stones that we walk on. And in my walk this morning, I was reflecting on what that meant. This place, we're the capital city of our, of our tiny country at the bottom of the world, a really important place. And I've thought about the types of change that's happened in New Zealand because of types of people like you, because of the actions they took. The amazing actions, the incredible things. I'm just gonna whip through really fast. Parihaka, you know, the absolute quintessential um, engagement of passive, pacifist engagement and, and protest. Uh, suffragette movement, incredible breakthrough. You know, we have 100, 100 years of this incredible breakthrough. All sorts of protests have been, have been started in this place. 
Wellington and in wider New Zealand that have had a huge impact on society because it's only when people really care and then they do something that change happens. And I'm just flipping through some of these things today that I saw in many of these in my lifetime, things that have had a substantial impact. I was at that rally. (laughs) I was uh, Googling it earlier. You can probably find me somewhere in there. That was when the student loans first came in. I remember we marched through the the square in Palmerston North yelling, and excuse me, fuck off, Phil Goff, fuck off, Phil Goff. It's funny, because I know him now. He's actually a really nice guy, you know, but... um, (laughs) But back then, you know, we were just protesting, you know. It was like, yeah, let's all do this together. Like, oh, protests take all sorts of things, you know. Sometimes they're quiet protests. Sometimes they're loud protests. They're things that matter to people. They're parts of our society that they want their voice heard. And other stuff as well. <laughs> and I want to talk to you, because if you think all that's really hard, yeah, it's really hard to organise a rally. Oh, my God, we've got to get paint. We've got to paint stuff. Think about how change actually happens, yeah? Change doesn't happen by suddenly there's 5,000 people in a square marching. Change happens like this. Change happens because some crazy person decides he wants, or she wants to, or they want to do something differently. And they just start. And initially, everyone's looking at them going, look at that crazy person by themselves doing that crazy thing with their stupid idea. And then someone says, actually, I quite like that idea. (laughs) And this person's the real hero in the story because he's going, oh, let's join in with the crazy guy. Let's all be a bit crazy. And so other people are going, I'm not sure they're a bit fringe. I don't like them. I don't know what they're talking about. And then suddenly more and more people will join. And soon it becomes uncomfortable not to be part of this movement. And people start (laughs) rushing in. And they want to be part of your change. They love to be part of your change. This is how change happens. It starts with someone sparking a little flame and other people believing enough to join in and then soon you have a movement. We are the change! Woo! We are the change. We didn't rehearse that. Um, Look, I reflect on the last couple of days. We are the change. Here's some of the change we've seen over the last couple of days. We've seen some incredible people and this isn't all of them. I just thought, wow, these are some of the people that I just jumped out to me. Man, we are the change. These, this is what change looks like in modern New Zealand. These are the people who are wanting to make change. This, this is, the, this is the, the beauty of the, the story, the corridors that they've given us. And there's, we've just seen so many. I'm just going to keep clicking because there's just so many. And I, I, I'm going to finish by thinking, if you're sitting there in the audience going, wow, I really like this idea of like taking an idea and making it big. Here's the widow laid down to you. Start the change, be the change, lead the change, involve others in the change. And this time, next year, at the next 2022, and I hope a guy, it's okay with you, but I'm, I'm saying, we'd love to see you as next year's keynote speaker. Nōrera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratato katoa. Kia ora.